Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Chicago Humanities Festival and tonight's program, Monuments and Memorials. My name is Allison Cuddy, and I'm the Marilyn Toma Artistic Director at the Chicago Humanities Festival. So we've just kicked off our fall season this week, and you can learn more about upcoming events at chicagohumanities.org. And we hope while you're there, you will consider supporting this free programming um, or become a member. Thanks to our captioner for making this event accessible. If you want to learn more about accessibility services at CHF, go to chicagohumanities.org slash access, and you can activate closed captioning within the YouTube environment. This program is generously underwritten by the Terra Foundation for American Art, and I'm pleased to report that we will have more programs on art and Chicago coming up thanks to the support of the Terra. All of our programs this week are supported by the Robert R. McCormick Foundation. Thank you. And meanwhile, the topic of monuments and memorials has gotten pretty heated of late. Um, we are hoping to have a conversation thinking about how to move forward and what new approaches to memorializing look like with a really incredible panel of women who are artists, activists, scholars, and community organizers. And on this note, I wanted to alert you to an upcoming opportunity to see a monument in process, which results from a partnership between Studio Brazen and a longstanding CHF friend and collaborator at the National Public Housing Museum. The monument is called At Home, and it memorializes the everyday lives and stories of public housing. It will be projected onto the future home of the Public Housing Museum. You can see it at their website, nphm.org or on our Instagram account at Shy Humanities, and it will run October 7th through the 10th at 7 p.m. And now, please help me in welcoming Romy Crawford, Courtney Joseph, Patricia Nyan in conversation with Jennifer Scott. Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Thank you to the Chicago Humanities Festival for hosting this conversation. My name is Jennifer Scott and I will be the moderator for this program. Uh, we are meeting virtually, virtually here, but we're all coming from different places beyond Chicago. And so we wanna begin the program by acknowledging the traditional native lands that we are connected to here in Chicago. And we are borrowing this land acknowledgement from Enrich Chicago, a very important cultural leader here in the city. So thank you, Enrich. So if you all will reflect with me for a moment. We are in the traditional homelands of the Council of Three Fires People. This area has long been a vibrant site of trade, life, and community making for many indigenous nations and is still home to 65,000 American Indian people. We wish to pay our respects to elders past and present for their stewardship of this land and acknowledge that many of us as the current occupants are here as a legacy of the settler colonial state. And I also wanna add um, a statement that Enrich also adds, which I think is really important. They say such statements become truly meaningful when coupled with authentic relationships and sustained commitment. We are committed to moving beyond words into programs and actions that fully embody a commitment to indigenous rights and cultural equity. So thank you, Enrich, for that call to action. And of course, uh, this land acknowledgement relates directly to this evening's topic, which is on memorials and contested landscapes. So thanks again to the Chicago Humanities Festival for hosting such a timely conversation and for inviting me to moderate and I say timely just to set the stage, because even though people have been fighting for many decades against offensive and racist monuments, street names, parks, public squares, et cetera, the fight has become reinvigorated with recent political uprising efforts. I would say at least in the last five years, if not longer. And I'm thinking of um, 2015 with the, the terrible Charleston church massacre. Uh, shortly after that, if you remember Bree Newsom famously pulled down the Confederate flag from the state capitol there. And then you started to see reverberations across the country, even across the globe, with people demanding to take down and remove Confederate monuments. So in Chicago, we also have our own monuments to contend with. And I'm just gonna give a couple of examples to set the stage. And of course our speakers will help fill in, in the gaps as well. 
Um, just last year, the, the Congress Parkway, a major boulevard here in Chicago, was renamed for Ida B. Wells Barnett, who's an anti-lynching activist and journalist. And this has happened many, many years after Michelle Duster, who is the great granddaughter of Ida B. Wells, uh, and her family and many other local activists have been trying to properly memorialize her legacy for a very long time. So the good news is that uh, a monument is also in the works, so stay tuned. Um, also mirroring what's been happening uh, nationally, many, many Col Christopher Columbus statues have been coming down. And in Chicago, just in the past, past month or two, three Christopher Columbus statues were taken down by the city of Chicago in various parks. And just this week, it's actually, it might even be yesterday, I'm losing track of time, but the Chicago Park District just announced that Douglas Park on the west side of Chicago, which was named after Stephen Douglas, who's a pro-slavery senator, uh, will be renamed. And most likely it will be renamed after very well-known black abolitionist, Anna Murray and Frederick Douglass. Um, and of course, you may have heard the city just formed a new Memorials and Monuments Advisory Committee, which I'm honored to be a co-chair of, that is slated to assess the city's memorials and monuments and public art collections and to make recommendations. So all of that to say there's a lot of energy locally and nationally and willfulness to reflect on how we memorialize and who or what we decide to memorialize and also who gets to decide this. So I'm looking forward to this rich discussion with our powerful speakers. I have the pleasure, pleasure of introducing them right now. Um, we have uh, artists and scholars um, and who will um, share their work with us. And then we'll dive into the conversation and hopefully at the end have a little bit of time for uh, Q&A from the chat. Um, we may not get to all the questions, but we're going to do our best. <laughs> so I will start with uh, introducing Dr. Courtney Pierre-Joseph who is an assistant professor of history. And if you could just wave or something Courtney, to let people know where you are. Um, an assistant professor of history and African-American studies at Lake Forest College. She has done tons of oral history work with members uh, in particular of the Chicago Haitian diaspora. And she's currently working on her manuscript, which is tentatively titled The Sob Sobble Diaspora, Haiti, Blackness and Belonging in Chicago. 1935 to 2010. And she has been doing a lot of work on marking the legacy of Jean-Baptiste Point de Saab, Chicago's first non-native settler, which I'm sure we will hear more about. Um, I'm also, I'd like to introduce Dr. Romery Crawford, who is also a professor but of visual and critical studies at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Her research and writing explores areas of race and ethnicity as these relate to American visual culture. She's one of the co-authors of The Wall of Respect, Public Art and Black Liberation in 1960 Chicago, and she has a new book coming out titled Fleeting Monuments for the Wall of Respect. Uh, and our third panelist is Patricia Wen. Patricia is the Director of Undergraduate Studies and the assistant, an Assistant Professor in Asian American Studies at Northwestern University. Her research and performance work examines state violence, the prison industrial complex, critical refugee studies, political economy, forced migration, intergenerational trauma, torture, and nation building in the US and Vietnam. Dr. Nguyen is an award-winning memorial designer for the Chicago Torture Justice Memorial Project, the first monument in the United States to honor survivors of police violence. And we will hear more about this project, hopefully. So we wanna dig in with the first question. Um, if you could talk about how your work intersects with the current debate around monuments and memorializing. memorializing. Tell us what you're working on right now. So we're going to start with Courtney Pierre-Joseph. Um, first, thank you so much, the Chicago Humanities Festival. Thank you, Jennifer, Romy, Patricia, so much for um, being here with me this evening. I am just so excited to be here and to have this conversation. Um, so yeah, what am I working on? Well, um, I am. my work is really rooted as a historian in thinking about the histories we don't tell, um, the histories that are difficult for us to tell, the histories that are um, dangerous in some instances for us to tell, um, especially when we think about oral histories, right? And, and how those intersect with how we think about telling history and the power of 
the archive? What about people who, for oppressive reasons, for racist reasons, for all sorts of reasons, do not have access to the written word, don't have access to literacy, and thus don't have access to the archive? If we think about the fact that often those same peoples are rooted in a long generation of oral traditions via word and song and all sorts of things to still hold their histories, that's the stuff that I'm working on and makes me very excited. And so I guess I'll go to the first slide with how, how did I get here? So um, back in, in 2014, when it was time for me to write my dissertation, it was really important to me to think about a story that as many people say you should care about, right? When you're writing dissertation, cause honey, it is with you forever. Um, and so I wanted to do something that was close to my heart. And um, I just so happened to also be the um, last daughter to two Haitian immigrant parents who migrated to Chicago in 1968 and 1969. And suddenly while I was doing my dissertation research or thinking about a topic, I realized that I knew of a Chicago Haitian community, but so many other people did not. And so that drove me to start looking from a historical perspective and where do I find myself here? With the image we see here, this man himself, Jean-Baptiste Pointe du Sable, the first non-native settler of Chicago, who many consider the father of Chicago, a man of Haitian descent. How do we not know this? How does somebody who grew up in Chicago as a young Haitian girl, a young black woman, not know that this place, this land that I walk on every day, this place, somebody who looked just like me was doing that, you know, over 200 years ago. And so I started to figure out why, why don't I know this? Why don't we know this? Because I feel like monuments and memorials are about what we know as a society, right? Like what do we know and what do we say about ourselves? We make choices with that because as Jennifer, you said at the beginning, we live on the land where the history is all the time. It's all the time, right? Like there is a history of things that have happened here for you know centuries and centuries, but we make choices on what stories about that land we take or that, that we tell. So why did we make the choice to not talk about Jean-Baptiste Point du Sap? And when do we start to make a, a choice? What does that story look like? And that's really where my work begins, starting with the Jean-Baptiste Point du Sap moment in the late 1700s in Chicago. And we can't talk about du Sap without talking about the woman that he married, that I will continue to say, if it wasn't for her, there would be no him, right? Kitty Hawa, a woman of Potawatomi descent who marries this man and teaches him about the land, a land that he did not know of, you know what I mean? Being born on the island of Saint Domingue at its precipice of becoming the first independent black nation, fighting off slavery. This is a really pivotal time and this is all happening on this land at the same time. But he is a black man now in the age of America where we are building a country on the backs of black people while we are dehumanizing them. And so how do we say Chicago, the third city, right, that Chicago, that, that the United States is staking itself on, is first settled, first built, has the first home, the first marriage, the first thriving, successful business. He's Black, and his wife is Indigenous. So then we start to think about why, sir, you know, some of this stuff is hidden over time, and when does it really become uh, memorialized again? So this moment right here is almost 150 years after. We're looking at an image of the pamphlet made by Black women at the 1933 World's Fair, where they say, via oral traditions, we've heard the story of Dusab. Where is he? Why aren't we talking about him at this World's Fair? How dare we have a World Fair and not commemorate this man and his family and his legacy. And so they build a cabin and they create this pamphlet and we start to then see what becomes, I would say, a hundred plus year struggle to reclaim the history of Dusab. Guess next slide. Which this is the memorial right now. You probably have seen this. It's near the Apple store downtown. It went away for a little bit when Apple was building its store, which, you know, that's another thing that we can talk about. But it's back, it's back on the magnificent mile. This small bust, when we think about who, where did this bust come from? It comes in 2009 by a Haitian man. Again, thinking about the importance of Haitianness and Blackness to this story. A man of Haitian descent of this same diaspora puts his money together to commission a bust 
to honor again the person who looks like him, was like him, and sets the stage for a larger Haitian community to form. So he, he gets this commissioned by an artist and this is put in downtown Chicago. But what else? What else? What else is there for Dusak? It's just this small bust. I mean, we have all sorts of names all over Chicago. I didn't know there were three Columbus statues. Three? That's for later on in the conversation. But there's this, right? And so what does that mean that there's just this? This also calls into question the activism that has been happening to see a 30 year project finally come to life. And I guess that's where my last slide comes in. This project you see here, which is part of um, the Floating Museum's Founders exhibit came up last year. It's DuSable's head, Kitty Howe's head, and it's also Harold Washington's head and it's called Founders. Why those three together? Because Harold Washington, the very first black mayor of Chicago in 19, 1980s, one of the final things he does before his untimely death is dedicate 3.1 acres of prime Chicago real estate, the mouth of the Chicago River, right across from Navy Pier, at the end of the Chicago River Walk to be dedicated and made into DuSable Park. He did this in 86. I happened to be born in 86. I just celebrated my 34th birthday. There is no park. So what does it say when we even say we're gonna memorialize something and we don't do it? We don't fully see it realized why don't we fully see this particular story realized and so you see this floating head museum as a way to alert people to the fact that this park is still not built and that we should really be thinking about why so again my work is really about memorializing voices and histories that i think are hidden on purpose and really thinking about why why are they hidden what are the stakes of being hidden and what do we learn when we start to uncover them Thank you so much. I'm so excited for this. Thank you, Courtney, and happy belated birthday. <laughs> Romy, you're next. OK, great. Thank you. Um, and you know, I think uh, the, the case that I'm going to talk about and the work that I'm going to speak about actually relates a lot to, to Courtney's um, insofar as it, it really locates a, a very specific uh, Chicago history. Um, a couple of years ago, I worked to, as a co-author on a, on a book, a publication called The Wall of Respect, Public Art and Black Liberation in 1960s Chicago. Um, and this, was, uh, this book was ostensibly about the Wall of Respect mural, a mural that was, was made in 1967 by 14 members of Obasi, the Organization of, of, of Black American Culture. Um, and it depicted uh, various African American uh, uh, heroes and heroines, which, as they described them, in in various subjects: um, uh, uh, literature, music, uh, uh, statesmanship, etc. Um, and uh, in, without getting too far in, in deep into the, the wall history and the, the, the project of that book, I'll say that one of the problems that kept coming up over and over again was that. Um, the wall uh, no longer exists. So it was uh, produced, uh, the mural was, was produced and made in 1967 and had a fairly short uh, shelf life, about uh, five years um, with, during the five year period when it was intact. And so if one were to go to the 43rd and Langley site in Chicago on the south side of Chicago, where the wall was was made and produced, um, uh, they would they would not find it. It's not there, um, and so this was a the sort of sort of constant struggle and problem as we as we talked about the the mural, as we um, worked. We actually did a, did a lot of work to try to, uh, to to bring it to life as best we can to sort of visualize it and to represent it and to to flesh out the history of the wall of respect. But but nonetheless, um, if you go to the location, it's 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 not there. It's not present. So really from that, um, I uh, started to, to conceptualize and, and theorize and think through um, a sort of logic for, uh, for marking uh, a history or, or an historical project um, like the Wall of Respect um, um, in, in ways that were uh, informed by what we learned from the wall itself. 
And so um, rather than, and I thought for a while about sort of petitioning the, the city for a, a, a sign or a, a thing, an object at the location, a plaque, you know, all of the, the, the normal logics. Um, and then I didn't get very far in that because I wasn't certain that that was the, the best route. And so instead I started to, to sort of uh, uh, again conceptualize and theorize around other possibilities and the potential of something much more uh, fleeting in so far as the wall had this uh, this short existence, you know, and and uh, I thought, why can't um, memorials and monuments and edifices, which are meant to mark an historical event or object or person, be uh, be slighter and less precious and less heroic and less obdurate and all of that. Um, and so I, I I started to um, to 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 uh, uh, think about a, a prompt for various artists um, to, to think through this with me. And the first person that I, um, I was in touch with was an artist named Kelly Lloyd, and I'll actually get to her slide in a, in a moment. But, but, but I, I, I asked Kelly to, to think about how she could produce something that, that, that was a short form um, in terms of duration that didn't take her a lot of time, uh, something that was, uh, that was more ephemeral, um, and something that nonetheless um, spoke to and addressed the wall of respect some um, history. And, and it, within the course of about two years, I asked several other artists uh, uh, and thinkers based in Chicago for the most part um, to do this and to, to follow through on this prompt. And so this book called Fleeting Monuments for the Wall of Respect um, was realized based on the theorization and the conceptualization and then the prompt that several artists followed through on with me. Um, so the book comes out uh, later this year, um, and it's uh, published by Green Lantern Press and distributed by the University of Minnesota. So I think we can go to the next slide. And and so a lot of what what I what I tried to get to in 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 the book was was again how a, a, a monument or something that marks a, a, an historical project. Could be informed by the wall's history, and so I, you know, one of the the things that matters to me a lot is that, the, or a second operation in addition to the conceptualization was to think how the wall case could inform and be instructive, and and so I I paid a lot of attention to logic such as hesit hesitancy, improvisation affection, storytelling, and gifting. Uh, the wall was ostensibly a gift for the South Side community. Um, uh, there were various modes of, of, of the familiarity and sociality and um, friendship and camaraderie and fraternity, fraternity uh, that took place at the wall. So it was kind of an affectionate space. Um, there was storytelling, um, improvisation was, was part of the, the kind of process and mode of producing the wall. Um, and the, the hesitancy uh, uh, speaks to, to the, 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 the fact that it, it does not um, it exist forever. And so in the book, I, I again try to, to parse out some of these, these, these logics that inform the wall. And I think about how these could inform uh, future monuments and future memorials and future practices of, of marking historical persons or, or events, um, et cetera. And so uh, the next slide gets us to one of the projects I mentioned early, just earlier, just briefly, um, that of Kelly Lloyd. So Kelly Lloyd is an artist uh, that was based in Chicago. Um, she followed through on this prompt with several gestures, um, and some of them were were were, were sort of uh, local and and very small. Um, and anti-heroic um, in their own way. And this became one of her more grand projects, if you will. Um, and it, uh, she was living abroad at the time and, and she was interested in this prompt and, and stayed with it for a while. So she produced um, a billboard um, that is in commemoration of one of the heroes that is depicted on the wall of respect, Marcus Garvey. Um, and 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 this is her way of of sort of learning about the wall's history, marking it, memorial, creating a memorial to it. Um, but of course, this this uh, billboard does not last for forever. It's 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 been down for for a year or so. Um, so so again, the 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 project here is mostly about 
using the histories that are sort of missing in action um, in the way that, that Courtney spoke about, spoke about them earlier to actually inform us into the future. So, so it's a way of saying that I'm, I'm not only interested in the fact that the, the histories are, are not there and are in the race, I'm actually more interested in the fact that the, the modes of knowledge, what we know and could um, learn from these histories are also disappeared. And so the, the wall of respect and the, the making practices that, that, that went into that, that project actually you know, informed us many years ago in 67 that, that an artwork does not need to live forever and it does not need to be made of, of bronze and, and uh, precious metals. And it does not need to, to be in a, on a pedestal. Um, and it can be made without much money. Um, and it can be made without the sanction of the city. Um, and, and so those are, are, again, you know, going back more than 50 years, uh, sort of, you know, uh, 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 modes and, and ways that can inform how we produce monuments in the, in the present. So it's that deeper knowledge piece that goes into the histories that are often um, um, erased and, and not apparent that is as important I think in this project and, and, and in the work that I'm, that I'm up to now, as is sort of placing something um, or offering some gesture in its place. Okay. Thank you, Romy. And, and thanks for raising that question about the possibilities of memorials. We're gonna, we're gonna dive a little deeper into that soon. Um, but let's hear from Patricia Wen. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jennifer, for um, moderating and the Chicago Humanities Festival. It's so great to hear about your work, Courtney and Rami. Um, it's uh, really beautiful and um, I'm really excited to learn more as we continue to dialogue together. Um, so I am one of the designers along with John Lee for the Chicago Torture Justice Memorial Project. Um, and so we can go to the first slide. Um, and so just a little bit of background about the Chicago Torture Justice Memorial Project. Um, it honors the survivors of Chicago police torture. And um, John Burge was actually a Chicago police commander that rose to the ranks of commander after he was trained by the CIA to torture and assassinate people during the Vietnam American War. And so he brought back those techniques to Chicago to torture over 125 and counting um, predominantly black and uh, some Latinx men and um, a few women. And um, it's harder for women actually to come forth because violence against women is so normalized in some ways. So how do you actually talk about um, the violence that Black women have endured um, in, under police um, in many different ways, right? And so um, the, the Chicago Torture Justice Memorial Project is part of one of the aspects of the reparations ordinance. And this reparations ordinance is historic. It is the first reparations ordinance in the country in the country that addresses police violence and actually honors the survivors and what they've had to go through. And this was actually made possible by um, intergenerational, inter racial decades of organizing by folks in the Chicago Torture Justice Memorial Project, Project NIA, Recharge Genocide, Amnesty International USA, um, and including folks from the Black Lives Matter movement during 2015. So this year is the fifth year anniversary since the ordinance was passed. Um, and part of the ordinance includes uh, CPS, Chicago Public School Curriculum. It includes uh, evidentiary hearings uh, for survivors. It includes um, a lot of different things that uh, I wish I actually had a slide to show, um, and also healthcare services, uh, psychological services that is available at the Chicago Torture Justice Center. Um, and one of the last aspects of the ordinance to actually come into fruition is the memorial. And it's really thinking about like um, reparations and the limitations of the law itself, right? That um, the amount of financial compensation, the amount of intergenerational trauma that people have experienced cannot just be wiped away through a payment, right? Or uh, 
Um, and so what does it mean to actually build a memorial to honor the lives of people who are still alive in many ways, who are still fighting for their lives, um, and also for those who have passed. And so in thinking about what this memorial is, it's I'm thinking alongside um, Doris Salcedo, who is in a, who's a Colombian artist and her idea of a monumental anti-monument. And I wanna think about monuments in terms of like how sometimes monuments can trap a sense of time. That a city and a municipality can say that we've dealt with that history, here's a statue, here's a sculpture, there it is. And it's kind of trapped in time in that way. And what we really wanted to do was think about how there's such a rich history of community organizing and activism in Chicago and police violence still exists, right? And state violence still exists. And so the fight isn't over. And part of creating this memorial is also thinking about like how time continues. And so um, there's so many different aspects of the memorial that I can talk about, um, but I wanted to think through um, the different aspects of it. Uh, there's four different aspects of the memorial uh, that are based in community uh, driven processes. And so before we were invited to contribute at, as artists, a proposal for the memorial, the Chicago Torture Justice Memorial Project actually led an extensive community based um, process with survivors to ask them what they wanted, ask them what they wanted a memorial to look like and feel like. And 100% of the survivors, all of the survivors said that they wanted to make sure their names were on it. And so for us, that was a non-negotiable in any way. That was, we wanted to make sure that when you enter the memorial, you see the names of the survivors and they are named properly. And we are, there's also space on the memorial for additional names to be added as people come forth. Um, the second aspect of the memorial is uh, the timeline. So we wanted actually the timeline to uh, begin when you see the names of the survivors and it actually folds into a community space so that the timeline doesn't end with the passing of the ordinance or a particular historical marker, but it actually folds into the lived present marking of what it means to make history in community, what it means to actually um, collaborate with local organizations, collectives, survivors, and have this be a field trip site um, that is embedded with the reparations ordinance itself, the ordinance itself that can come alive. Um, the other aspect of it, the third one is um, the, the community space itself. And so here it can be activated as like a gallery space, a space for a cookout, a space for like a lecture, a panel. It can kind of be converted in different ways, but we really just wanted to think about how the space can hold um, people together in community and, and have it be open air. Um, and then the last aspect of it is manifestos. So actually working with survivors who were forced to confess. Um, to write their hopes and dreams for the future and for that to be etched on the walls of the uh, memorial itself as a reparative process of pushing back against these um, violent uh, ways in which uh, people were forced into confessions of crimes and then incarcerated as a result of that, many of which were incarcerated for decades and put on death row and all of that. Um, and so, the whole idea of this memorial and the name of it is called Breath, Form, and Freedom. And I wanted to think about breath and we wanted to think about breath as a meditation of just thinking through like the suffocation of breath, right? Like one of the torture techniques um, that was used was suffocation and also just calling upon just thinking about Eric Garner, right? And most recently, even though this happened after George Floyd, that these are techniques that are continually used to, to take away black life in many ways. And, and then we were wanting to think about that in relationship to Franz Fanon's idea of combat breathing. What does it mean to breathe um, under conditions of colonial duress, right? To push back in many ways. And so we wanted to think about breath in relationship to um, the continued breath that is living and moving through the community through um, the fight for justice that continues in many ways. Um, and uh, that many of the survivors, including Anthony Holmes, who's 
one of the first survivors to say that we're, that they're still here, that they're, that they're still alive. So how can we create a, mo a monument, a, a memorial of sorts that actually offers a space for them to continue to, to share their wisdom and their knowledge with us? Um, and then thinking about breath as it moves through um, the different types of material that we use, the way that the sun hits the, you know, the, the cement or just like open air. We wanted to think about this and how it can be a meditative space for survivors. And that's also one of the things that they hoped for in a memorial. And just thinking about the form and the shape of it. What does it mean to actually invert structures of surveillance? Um, and really think about this as like, um, to hold and to be held, right? Um, and also, and I can go on into that a little bit more, um, but also question the notion of freedom, right? That I, the idea of freedom in the United States has been built on indigenous genocide and anti-blackness and slavery. So how do we kind of invert that and question it in the ways that we can um, expand how we enter the frame to think about what freedom can mean in, in the architecture and the landscape of a space and how we can like actually reclaim that collectively. And, and one thing that I'll add real quick is that um, in relationship to the debates around monuments and memorials, it was because of uh, a young black and indigenous youth that led the protests to at Buckingham Fountain, which led the charge to pull down the Columbus statue, that was that that was made possible. All those Columbus statues were taken down and was made possible because of those organizing efforts, because of young Black and Indigenous folks that were putting their bodies on the forefront, that were showing that even though these are symbols of colonial remnants and past, that they're still very present in how we see property is protected. And they put their own bodies on the line uh, facing tear gas to actually pull them down. And so I just wanted to link the, the different histories of organizing um, youth-led, um, Black-led, Indigenous-led organizing that actually creates the foundations for new structures to be built in this city. Thank you, Patricia. And thank you all, all for sharing uh, your work. Um, I'm really glad that you raised that point about um, the activism, Patricia. One of the things that strikes me in all of your presentations is, is the silences, the invisibility, the histories we don't tell. These are, these are connecting all of your projects. And so I guess my question is sort of um, two part. One is it's not that people haven't been trying to make these changes and correct these invisibilities. And so there's a kind of systematicness <laughs> You know that this is like highly crafted these erasures and so one I wanted I wanted to see if you could all speak more to that invisibility and the silences and why they're ha why they happen or why they continue to happen um, and then part two <laughs> um, you know what's at stake here why is it important to um, memorialize for us and and you know what what does this mean to communities? What is this, you know, you all sort of touched on it. I want you to go a little bit deeper. What does this mean to you? You know, why there's so much passion and energy. And so I just want us to pull out a little bit more what's behind it and sort of maybe connect those. So who'd like to take a stab? Courtney, go ahead. I guess so why why the silence, why the invisibility? I mean, we're at a moment right now where we're seeing, again, legislation even against certain histories being told, like putting out legislation to say, we are not going to teach this. This is anti-American to teach this. This is unpatriotic to talk about this stuff. But why? Why is that un-American to address problems and to address atrocities. Why do we turn away from them as opposed to turning to them? And I think it's because again, as Patricia and Romy said, we're still dealing with these things, right? They're still here. And so in order to, if you memorialize them and if you talk about them, then you have to do something about them now. But if you keep them hidden, then we can kind of keep going business as usual, right? And so, I mean, 
I bring up the fact that there's legislation, like there are campaigns to keep these things silent over time. In the story of Dusab, there was a campaign to keep that hidden by the people who immediately re overtake Chicago as a white space. And so Dusab will leave Chicago in 1800. Historians have lots of questions or you know um, thoughts of why, but he leaves the area, and I, I would say largely because it's it's dawning on him that the tide is changing. This is becoming a white settler space that does not have um, room for multicultural, um, you know, visibility, especially in ways that are, are at a top or seen in a, in a top positioning. And so once Dussault believes that he sells his home to a man by the name of Jean Lalime, who's a Frenchman that he had known, who turns around and sells the home to John Kinsey, a former slave owner who becomes recognized as the father of Chicago. Like how Columbus and colonial is that to move into the man's house and say, it's, uh, it's mine now, I did this, this is all me. And it's his daughter-in-law, Juliet Kinsey, who writes one of the first history of Chicago, comes out in 1856, where she then declares in a really public way, that's why I was talking about the archive and literacy. We don't have any DuSable documents left behind, not many of them, but we have tons of Kinsey documents left behind and, and photographs and writings and all of that. And, and this book and this history gives it a legitimacy that again allows for other things to be to be left out and to not be told and so along with the Kinsey's you have a man by the name of John Wentworth who was a businessman early historian in Chicago as well who in the late 1850s at the time where we're debating as a country the institution of slavery again that being there as the context for him to say by the way there used to be a black man who lived here who was trying to turn this into a black colony, a black Haitian colony even. We have to remember the, the narrative of Haiti as being this, you know, this thing that the unthinkable is, as Trio calls it, right? Like a, the colony that, um, that liberates itself, the slave colony that liberates itself, something people don't want to see. And so tying- Courtney, can I yeah, interject yeah. there? You're, there's a question from an audience person, Elizabeth Peterson. Will the Sabal ever get a street in Chicago? I, I, maybe, um, I, I don't know. I think right now, a lot of the activism, which I was happy Patricia brought up is, is around this park. And we do have some movement on the park finally, you know, Related Midwest has dedicated money to seeing this park and also, you know, said they would build it. Um, the mayor of Chicago recently said the city would pledge $5 million to actually seeing it constructed. But will it happen? I'm very hopeful, but we shall see. Because again, this has been a three plus decade thing. Um, but I, I say litter his name and, and Kitty Hawa's name everywhere around the city. We should, we should know them. We should be familiar with them. Yeah, Thank and I would, I would, oh, I would just, go ahead, Rami. Yeah, I just want to jump in and say, you know, I, I think that one of the the things that I'm I'm really trying to 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 deal with and grapple with in in, in this kind of monument and memorials uh, issue as it shows up right now is, for instance, um, there could be a street at 43rd and Langley that's that's named after the wall or a street that's named after Du Sable, but um, but I would really think also that we should push for maybe locating because it's a type of lo locating as well locating you know what du sable taught us what we learn what chicago learns from du sable at a deeper way that should be a kind of you know what what you know what again what knowledge apparatus mm -hmm. du sable brings to the table and then allows and then making that part of of, of how we understand our city, how we understand other cities, how we understand uh, American culture, Black culture, Haitian culture, et cetera. And, and so I, I think that that's part of what I want to sort of slow down a little bit is the, the kind of rushing around. And, you know, and I did this with the wall case, but I, I do think, think about the fleeting monuments around lots of different cases, right? So it's sort of fleeting monuments for the wall of respect, but it could be fleeting monuments for Du Sable, as you're already up to, to Courtney, or fleeting monuments for so many other um, minoritized histories, because I really do think that it's, it's the, the, the absence that's really profound is the absence not of, of a street or a bust, 
or something like that, but the absence of truly understanding how DuSable contributed to the epistemology of of what from you know you know better than I do, Courtney, of of a, of of, of um, settler you know culture or or whatever that contribution is. That's the thing that needs to be um, most prevalent. It's not yeah, necessarily it's not just to to slap a name on something. And exactly. I think again, exactly. we get we get yeah. really fixated on a quick fix. Sometimes like, we did it. Look. We elected Obama. We did it. Like, you know, we check, we named the street, check, racism's over, or all of these atrocities are over. And there's, it's just like a low hanging fruit. It's just like the start. But what about then everything else that comes with it? What about recognizing that, again, we're still living with the legacies of these things. So now we have to address them in our policies and our our neighborhood policies and our housing and in our school system, like all of that, that would have to be addressed if we were to really grapple with who these people, these historical figures really were. Exactly. And in, this, in that spirit of slowing down and thinking through this process, there's a question that um, organizers gathered in advance of this program from a student that I'm gonna read. There has been a lot of recent outrage concerning monuments and memorials that seem to glorify slave owners and Confederates. How do we begin to reconstruct the narrative to show our violent history, respectful light without glorifying or normalizing the, it, the ideologies that come with those monuments? Would it be better to take them down completely and build memorials for say Frederick Douglass and William Lloyd Garrison, or perhaps Martin Luther King Jr. and Bayard Rustin? Or is the opposing argument to keep them up as a record of our history valid? So it's this question about, do we amend these monuments or do we remove them? Is it removing history? Um, maybe we can start with Patricia, since you're designing one, uh, your take on this. Well, I, I, I wanna bring in what Courtney and Rami talked about too, which is like um, the outlying of, uh, you know, certain topics, of discussion and schools, and then also um, the importance of education and the importance of curriculum and what does it mean to really think about um, how it's not just the building of an object, right, that is placed in a city or a naming of a street, um, but what does it mean to actually integrate that into like uh, critical the the public's critical consciousness in some ways and how does that enter um, like the educational system in some capacity and what I really um, respect about the Chicago Torture Justice Memorial Project and how it's part of the larger reparations ordinance was that the reparations ordinance really thought comprehensively about what reparations meant and what reparations looked like and that it wasn't just about let's give uh, survivors money, um, let's just name a street after them or something like that. It was really thinking about let, how do we pay for survivors and generations after to be able to go to city colleges. Um, how do we also integrate this curriculum about this kind of police and state violence that exists as and is deeply a part of Chicago's history into public school curriculum, into eighth grade and 10th grade curriculum? Um, and how is that actually integrated in a way that can be paired up with the memorial as a site that continues to activate public school curriculum. And so to, to think about the work of memorials and the work of monuments is actually how do we think beyond them as objects and how do we think about them as um, tools um, for actual um, embedded uh, engagement in uh, curriculum building in the way that we understand our educational systems in the way that we rethink our own um, mode of knowledge production right and the way that we even come to understand what we know and the structures that are because there's this huge campaign right that we all see across the nation that is led by movement for black lives um, to defund the police and we see that at, um, campaign happening also quite actively in chicago with a uh, cops out of CPS and the local organizing that's happening. And so um, what I'm also curious to know is how that is also embedded with like, um, what kind of curriculum, what kind of lesson plans are being built around this as well? And how is that also connected to this larger discussion around monuments that are being taken down in the city? And this new monument of the Chicago Torture Justice 
um, uh, you know, memorial actually being built as, as being at the forefront of what it means to uh, be community led and driven uh, by survivors who are most, who've been most impacted um, and really thinking about what does it mean to build community partnerships with people in the neighborhood, both community organizations and schools. And how does that become embedded in Chicago public school curriculum? And then how does it become a larger kind of ecosystem that exists? And so that's the way I'm thinking about the reparations ordinance as a, as a real model of really thinking through um, how we can be comprehensive about addressing these, uh, these histories without um, erasing them in any capacity, but also opening up possibilities for new futures. I think it's also important to think about when these monuments were put up, if we're talking about Confederate monuments and some of the things that are around the country that are now being taken down especially when we're talking about Confederate monuments, a lot of those go up in the civil rights movement period, right? Like they're not erected after the civil war, they're erected in the 1930s, 40s and 50s. So what does it say that we're actually memorializing not the Confederacy itself, which again, by the way, they lost, that we're talking about memorializing a moment when black people were actively and vocally and, you know, um, aggressively fighting for their rights to be heard. And this was what was responded to them, right? Was the memorialization of Confederate, the Confederate moment. So it, it's like, how, what a history are we erasing if we take them down? Is it the Confederacy itself or is it that, that backlash to the civil rights movement that we're actually talking about? <clears throat> Excuse me. Right. I was really struck, Patricia, by um, how you described the design for the new public memorial um, to be a very activated space that people can use in multiple ways. And you learned um, uh, that by this sort of community process. And so you were able to incorporate these educational opportunities. And I'm just, I'm wondering, you know, what an ideal community process that is inclusive or feels more inclusive about shaping these monuments and memorials, what that looks like to all of you um, it sounds like, you know, the Torture Justice Memorial seems like a really good model in many ways of inclusion. And I know, um, Courtney, you also use a lot of oral history, which is also could be seen as a community building tool as well. Um, so talk about that. You know, what what does the community process look like? How can we get it right from here on in? I'll jump in and say something. I was in sort of the, um, I don't know how to describe, maybe the background or the, the jury stage for the, the Chicago Torches, Torture Justice Memorial. Um, so I, I, I know a little bit about that. And one of the, the amazing things, I mean, I, I learned a lot from that process um, about um, the, 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 the degree to which memorials um, serve uh, have to serve the purpose of, of, of a community's sort of you know desires and needs and wants which you can't always expect um, so so when one engages and and solicits um, from from a, a, a cohort or community um, well, what they want to need from the memorial uh, you often find you, you you find out that it's not what you expect Right, and so, so um, you know, there's 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 memorials serve this really interesting um, place in our culture and society around kind of resolution and reparation, as you've said, Patricia, and and even more. I see. I think something even more effective, something um, that, uh, even even deeper around um, kind of you know a, a, a space for care and a, a space for for to blur love and and hug and all of that sort of thing is sort of built into um, some of these sites um, and and that's hard to anticipate and it's really hard to to know that that people want that um, I I definitely for instance I'll give an example I I thought something you know that they well, what about it you know a, a fleeting gesture for that that doesn't work for the Chicago Torture Justice Memorial there needed to be something a little bit more substantial because the the pain the trauma is is substantial. And so that needed to be to sort of, you know, um, demarcated in a, in a, in a, in a very uh, thorough way. And so, so my point is that there, there needs to be a lot of flexibility, I find, in, 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 in plotting out the best uh, resolution. And it really is sort of case by case in many instances. There's not a sort of one size fits all 
um, for any of these these projects. Courtney, did you want to weigh in on that? Um, yeah, so I'm actually in the process of um, transferring or the latter stages of transferring many of the oral histories that I've done, 60 of them in the last five years, to the Haitian American Museum of Chicago, which is at its earliest stages. It's an uptown, um, shout out to the Haitian American Museum, and um, to build a digital archive, right, of these oral histories so that they can be used later. But what I, I know about oral histories in it, a similar thing both Patricia and Rome you're saying about the need of care and flexibility like if people are giving you their stories you've got to be able to build a level of trust with them that you're not going to exploit their stories that you're not going to um, you know misappropriate their story in some way because that's also part of this history right like not that people haven't been telling their stories, but sometimes the way that they then are shared after they've told them are really in damaging and more traumatic ways, right? To see your story done and shown in a way that does not really reflect you and your community. And so I think it really does require care and understanding and love and building trust with the community so that they feel comfortable enough to share their ideas of how they want to be memorialized, how they want to be seen, as opposed to me imposing a vision um, when I am just one person. So can we talk a little bit more about the possibilities of monuments, the traditional statue, bronze statue, bronze plaque, you know, it denotes permanence. And, and it's, you know, I think part of the, the shock for some people that this is coming down is because they thought it would always be there. So I wonder if you all could talk a little bit about, you know, have we been thinking about the way we, the, the way we memorialize in, in, you know, not the right ways? Have we been thinking about it too narrowly? And should we be thinking about it as shifting and temporary? And will that have the same power and the in, impact? You know, what, what, is, um, what is possible to do justice to these legacies? I mean, I'll chime in because I, I absolutely think they can be more fluid and adaptable and they can negotiate the problematics of history without being um, powerful. I don't think they need to, to hold and capture power. I think that's part of their, their, um, you know, problematic at the moment. So, so I, I, I just am all about right now, uh, imagining and conceptualizing and theorizing a much more open, fluid, adaptable um, version of this. Um, but that's not to say that there shouldn't be other versions, right? Because I do think that 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 you you know, different histories need different different things, and so I think there need to be there needs to be a sort of a range uh, of options. Yeah, um, Joy Mogul, who was um, fundamental in um, putting together Chicago, the Chicago Torture Justice Memorial Project, and also writing the reparations ordinance, talked about the importance of of etching this memory uh, into the city's landscape, that the memorial actually allows for that to be a part of it. And so that, I mean, I'm, Joey said this much more eloquently than I am like re-quoting, um, but um, that actually stayed in my mind and just thinking about what does it mean to etch something into the landscape of a city, etch this history of violence, this history of, um, survival from the the people who had to endure this um, into into a city um, and actually have the city uh, take responsibility by by making sure that they allot land for it and also pay for it right um, as a part of an, a form of investment and account accountability and acknowledgement of these histories what does it mean to have that but then also to to have it, and I'm, I'm talking about it in the context of this memorial, because this is at the forefront of my mind, but also I'm, I, I, I deeply resonate with everything Romney, Rami is talking about in terms of the fleetingness of what these encounters and what how we can memorialize in different ways. And so uh, in thinking about the gathering space of the community, uh, 
or, or the gathering space in the monument itself, that it allows for these fleeting interactions to also happen in different ways. These other kind of um, ephemeral experiences, these moments of intimacy and care um, that last maybe for a one-off event, but that reverberate, reverberates in people's memories of like, their association with this space and with um, survivors or with other students. And so just thinking about how um, that can coexist in some way. So both in terms of like, what histories are we dealing with? Um, how do we need to involve the city if the city was um, a part of that playing a role in that history, right? But then also what, you know, what other work can be done that doesn't necessitate that? Right, that also can be really powerful um, and uh, offer us other other imaginaries that wouldn't be possible through other bureaucratic channels. Right, that um, actually allows for um, other kind of um, undercommons uh, of sorts or other publics to emerge in some way. Um, and and I'm thinking about this in relationship to some of the other work that I do with. Uh, refugee communities and just thinking about like uh, forced migration um, and you know uh, ruptures of how people understand resettlement unsettlement and home and so this idea of, of something that is not permanent in some way actually we try to build that <laughs> into the memorial in some way um, so yeah Courtney did you want to speak to that I mean, I'm going to echo because I think Rami's definitely got me thinking more, you know, about that um, idea that it doesn't have to be permanent. Like, I really I'm thinking a lot about that. And what comes to mind for me is thinking about, you know, we take down our flags at different times of the year right now. Right. Like they, we do this kind of in really uh, micro ways, but don't think about it as memorials of the moment. Like, but what if we were to think about how, goes back to an earlier point I was making about the fact that on this land, there's history all the time and we're making choices on what we mark and what we don't. And so what if, you know, each person in a community had enough agency to be able to mark these different histories for themselves and for their local communities with their own resources like they would, you know, whether it's 4th of July or whatever, these months, these things that go up that can come down, but don't need, you know, all of this bureaucracy and all of this money and all of these discussions. What if, you know, again, they could just be their own things that people had their own autonomy over. Mm -hmm. I think that's also a really powerful thing to consider. So, I mean, just thank you for that. Yeah, no, but I don't, I, I have to say, Jennifer, I think that the, the, you, you know, again, so many minoritized sort of, you know, ways and modes and histories are, have been sort of, you know, uh, uh, under recognized that that we don't even see or acknowledge that the way that you recognized First Nations land rights in an oral way at the start of this discussion is a type of memorializing. And so voice, um, our voices can sort of hold such an important, you know, gesture around marking and memorializing something regularly if we make a, a routine project of that. And so again, that doesn't cost $50,000, doesn't take the city to sign off on that. It doesn't have to be made in a big studio of bronze, you know, you did it. And that can happen regularly <laughs> all the time. And, and so those are the sort of things that, again, speak to not just the, the way of, you know, the, the marking, but getting to that deeper thing that we've lost around voice and orality and passing things on in, 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 in ways that are, that, are, that are informal and intimate and local and specific to this context. Such great points about the accessibility um, believe it or not, we only have about 10 minutes left, <laughs> and we have, there's a number of questions from the audience, so I want to get some of these in. Um, we have a question, can the panelists speak to any current examples of memorials or monuments that accomplish some of the things that have been discussed, for example, fluidity, community input and design, etc.? 
So Brian Stevenson's Equal Justice Initiative, opening up that lynching museum, um, you know, the, to remember our history, you know, again, we, that's a history that we definitely don't talk about, right? Especially not in schools, as Patricia was saying, but that is a long part of our history that, again, um, communal and state sanctioned violence against black bodies for asserting their rights after the civil war period that you know spans until probably the most famous lynching of Emmett Till, another Chicagoan, right, who's now having his home hopefully memorialized in the city soon. Um, the that museum was is really I think a great example of community driven right and so that it includes the dirt, the land from where the various lynchings took place and people are bringing them from these these different communities and marking them with names and so it's a um and then you you can just walk around and see them and so i think that's one example that i i've recently been really um, taken by in, in how that has able to respectfully and with the community and with the survivors of these you know, these horrible atrocious events, um, atrocious events that they're able to go to a place where it's remembered in a, in a, in a really powerful way. And that's the National Lynching uh, Monument in Montgomery, Alabama, um, which is super important. There's also a museum, I think it's called Legacy Museum that's uh, a part of that as well. Other examples from Romeo and Patricia? Um, I, I'll bring up some of these examples that 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 show up in the the project. Um, you know, they're, they're they, you know, I, I don't know if powerful is the word. I don't you know because I don't know what the gauge around that is, and and I don't know if if many of the artists uh, you know wanted to to kind of achieve that. But uh, there's a project where um, uh, one of the artists uh, puts a. Uh, puts notices up, up on bulletin boards and, and one can just sort of grab a, 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 a piece of it and sort of carry that, that sort of uh, quotable from the wall of respect history sort of with them. So it's a lot again about sort of uh, keeping something very close. You can grab it like you would grab a, a phone number from a, from a um, pull off sheet and just sort of keep it with you and, and uh, close to your body and all of that. Um, there was there were a couple of projects around poem poem writing and and going on walks and going on runs um, around the to, to the wall of respect site, which were were really provocative and important, I think, because they were again super embodied about sort of being in Chicago, being in that lo locale and that part of the city and experiencing that. So so you know I don't know if any any of these could kind of you know hold a lot of you know power in them, um, but I don't think that that's the, the kind of test of their um, worthiness. Um, Patricia? Yeah. There's, there's, a, there's so many that I can think of um, uh, in different ways. Uh, one is the Museum of Memory and Human Rights in Chile um, and just, um, just the scale of it and the comprehensiveness of how they delve into the different histories with various artists archives, spaces, photographs, um, other types of ephemera. It's, it's a fully embodied experience in different ways that um, I think uh, really captures uh, history and how it can be accessible through sound, um, through uh, just experiencing like, like uh, lights or, um, or candles or a series of photographs or a series of newspapers and um, news clippings and all of that. And I, I think that they've curated it really well to kind of, um, it's, it's not too didactic that it's boring, um, but it's, it's, it's just enough that uh, you actually get to understand the history that's being presented to you, but still there are layers and um, elements of it that are abstract enough that can kind of um, bring you to a different kind of spiritual relationship to honoring these, the histories, this his, these histories and, and the people whose lives were lost. And so um, that's one example that I can think of. Thank you. Thank you. Another question. It says, uh, thank you for all the great insights. What are your thoughts regarding memorials, design and structure as calls to action? 
can the call to action be purpose built and can that action be relevant in perpetuity? <laughs> so I guess to what extent do you see it and how it, as um, these, a, a memorial as a call to action in the actual design and structure? Well, Any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know if I totally understand what um, type of, of call call to action, but 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 you know, I, I, I do think that that we've talked about a couple of different projects which which include personal research, personal investment in time, personal engagement of the body and the mind, you know, personal connectivity to other people. Um, uh, whether you know, I love, I do love the part of of, of Patricia's project and conceptualization um, for the Torture Justice Memorial, where there is the opportunity to to convene. I think that's that's really sort of important. And so, so those are those are you know, to my mind, types of of actions. Again, they're they're not um, maybe at a certain scale. You know, one of the things that I was was really trying to to trouble was scale also. Um, and so that the thing doesn't have to be uh, grand in size, nor do I think it needs to be, the, the, nor does the thing need to be kind of grand in action. And so, so again, that's, that's sort of, you know, what, uh, what this little square has to say about that. One of the other squares probably has a really different take, but, um, but, but I, but, you know, that scale was another thing I didn't bring up earlier. And I think scale is really tremendous here too, um, to, to think about very different, differently and having, you know, petite actions or personal actions or intimate actions actually goes a long way in helping, um, an individual sort of really understand the history in a deeper way than just sort of passing a, a bust on the street and, and reading the two sentences about it. Um, and also, I, I think it, it, it's important in other ways, and it's 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 revitalizing in terms of you know one's physical and in, in a physical dimension as well. So, anyone else? I I actually agree with you Rami on so many on so many levels and 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 so I'm going to bracket how I agree and then also talk about the the um the Chicago torture justice more I know I'm like pressing it but it's just like it's 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 of the time <laughs> uh but but just really thinking about like um what does it mean to really build it right and thinking about what is the CPD budget what is their daily budget and how much and how is that you know how do we understand that in relationship to where funding as people are calling for the um, defunding of police how can funds actually be reinvested and reallocated into communities into like social service programming into mental health into public schools and into structures um, and buildings that can can be sustainable in some ways that can house um, and incubate ideas and communities to gather in these other ways. And so in terms of thinking about the built environment and, and funding and money and how it circulates in the city and thinking about state violence, I think that for for something like the Chicago Torture Justice Memorial Project, it's so important for a structure to be built. And it's so important to, it to, for it to be built and in conversation with the larger kind of frame of thinking about uh, what defunding police means. How do we think about the city budget? How do we think about where we're investing in communities? But also to return to what Rami said, I love these other intimate moments where the skills are so much smaller, where it's sometimes I think about um, memorials in Mexico of femicides for the women who, whose lives were lost and sometimes simple um, like objects like shoes or rose petals or candles or masks. And it's just people in a circle in a small square and it ends after an hour of prayer and ritual that that those are also really powerful in many ways and 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 can touch us so deeply and can activate a, another sense of engagement and so how do we kind of hold this together in different ways um so yeah thank you for sharing that patricia there's a question sort of interesting it says um such a great design and project 
did you meet resistance from the city over the word torture? Because that word is not commonly used in the media. Um, actually, we haven't. Um, so, but I would actually defer that question to, or I haven't experienced it coming later onto the project. So I'll only speak um, from my perspective, but um, that is a great question um, as to ask organizers who've been part of um, uh, the movement for reparations for decades and, and also people who have been part of uh, Recharge Genocide um, and Project Mia and their work um, in thinking about police violence um, and the carceral state in Chicago specifically and, and their relationship to that word because um, I think that they would be better at contextualizing it. But it's, it's, it's an important question because is torture the exception or is torture actually part of the apparatus of violence? And it points to the, the power of memorials to introduce new frameworks that aren't necessarily being utilized. So that's pretty exciting. We are already at time. So I, I, I just want to end on one question that went so fast. Um, so um, the question is just also two part, you know, what, what would you like to see memorialized that hasn't been memorialized or what has been the uh, most inspiring um, monument that you've experienced and why? So this will be your last, this will be your closing words. <laughs> Who wants to go first? Um, my, I want to see this park built and I want this park to be a place where people can be active, right? Like if it's a park space, then it's a place that people can go running in, a place that people can take walks in, walk their dog, learn about this history, sit with it, maybe do yoga, do all of those things. So hopefully we see this thing built. Um, but where, what's my favorite place? The National Museum of African American History and Culture in DC. If I could move inside of it, I would, um, because it is a beautiful space and it is a, another space that again was driven by activists. That museum takes a hundred years to finally come to life, right? And if you've ever been, I think three times, I'm really, I'm bad. I just, I want to live there. Um, it, it, there's something about being in a space that really remembers the history in a way. Um, and I've been to other historical sites around the country, whether it's the Lorraine Motel where Dr. King was assassinated or visiting Grassy Knoll where JFK was assassinated. There are these, I don't know, they, they, they feeling, they, they bring about feeling. And I think that that's um, both capital P the power and lower keys, lowercase p the power of being in these spaces and memorializing them is because you're able to connect with um, things of past and then potentially again re-envision a future where you are part of this longer past so um, shout out to to namak as well rami or patricia um i'll, I'll go um you know, I'm going to dodge it a little bit. I don't. I don't have a favorite. Um, there, there are lots that are that are that are great. And um, um, I, you know, I, I do think I'm 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 on this query with this book because I'm I'm on the lookout for for new and emergent uh, models. Um, and so something that feels more compelling than than what's there. And, 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 you know, related to that is, is, is allowing myself to, to sort of think through a process of, of being able to interpret um, power in history differently so that I can understand the potent, the, uh, you know, significance of, of, of these minor memorial events. I think it's really upon us to change our bearing and our relationship to history um, and how memorials mark history and events that is, is, is really sort of key and crucial for me. So, so I'm, I'm kind of in a different place where I'm, I'm looking out for something emergent and, and innovative and, and fresh around, around that question. Well said. Patricia, last word. Um, I would say that some of the kind of more fleeting uh, memorial-like sites 
or just like ways of gathering that I appreciate is like Freedom Square and also a lot of the mutual aid food distribution stuff that harken back to the Black Panther Party's work. Um, and, and, and also what I would like to see built is the Chicago Torture Justice Memorial, <laughs> which we're in the process of. Great. So we're at time. Thank you all for this conversation. Um, thank you to our brilliant speakers. Thank you to the Chicago Humanities Festival. And to all of you who attended, I hope you all have a, a great evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you so much.